السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank him for all the gifts that he has blessed us with And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness and ease And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his companions. May Allah bless his entire household and bless every single one of us. Brothers and sisters in Islam, tonight being a very great eve, the eve of Friday, and you know that that is the best eve from amongst the eves of the week. At the same time, the eve of the 27th of Ramadan, perhaps possibility of it being the night of decree. It is only an honor on such an evening to be speaking of the greatest of the women that we know, one whom we are so humbled to be able to speak about, the greatest in honor and rank, the one whom the Prophet ﷺ declared that he loved her the most, none other than Aisha binti Abi Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her and may he grant us all a lesson from her beautiful life. Inshallah, in the next few moments, we will go through just some of the aspects of the life of this great Sahabiyyah who is known as Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers, radiallahu anha. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, married women who were already previously married. Some of them were widowed, divorced, and so on. And subhanallah, this was the only one who was unmarried, Aisha radiallahu anha. And we know this. There are many people who pick on the fact that she was quite young when she was married. But to be honest, in all fairness, there are a few things we need to clarify in this regard. Number one, it was not all about lust and desire as we made mention of. And it's very important that we make mention of her. At that young age, we all know that people memorize things very quickly. At the age of nine, it is reported that she lived with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she memorized and she learned every single thing until she became known as the most knowledgeable from amongst all the women so much so that as Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu says I lived with my aunt I stayed with my aunt subhanallah Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu he says, I've never known someone more knowledgeable than her in a verse of the Quran. Nobody could come close. Nor in the laws of inheritance, nor in any practice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which we today call the sunnah, nor in poetry, nor in narrations and the knowing exactly who uttered what and when they said it in the presence of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as well as historical events that occurred and at the same time laws and regulations that were passed I knew no one who knew more than her so much so that she was the most knowledgeable of us the most knowledgeable of us even in medicine so I asked her how do you know so much of medicine so she made it clear to me that whenever I was sick Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to give me a remedy I memorized it and at the same time Brother, can you move it there, Sheikh? At the same time, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was visited by people who were sick and ill. And I heard exactly what he said to them and I memorized it. So this was part and parcel of the gift that she was bestowed with. And from a young age, she knew absolutely everything. She only lived with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for eight years and five months. That's it. Eight years and five months. That was her companionship with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a spouse. She lived in his home. She was the most loved by him. The only female who was not married, who married Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The rest of them, they were married before, as we'd made mention of. Sauda bint Zam'ah was quite an elderly woman who was married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is a discrepancy, obviously, difference of opinion as to who is higher in terms of rank between Aisha radiallahu anha and Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. So the bulk of the ummah would say Aisha radiallahu anha. And you have some people who say that it is actually Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha based on 
the hadith we made mention of yesterday when we spoke of Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. However, to bring those two opinions together is quite simple. There is no difference of opinion or discrepancy when it comes to bringing them together. At the time of Khadija radiallahu anha, she was the best. And at the time of Aisha radiallahu anha, she was the best, the most loved. Quite simple. And that is a great way of bringing the two together. There is no contradiction in narration. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and help us to honor this great woman. A woman whom the bulk of the deen has come to us through her. She was the one who narrated the most hadith without a dispute from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from amongst the women. Subhanallah. So much so that she had students who were males. Radiallahu anha. From amongst the Sahaba, the greatest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to come to her and ask her clarifications and questions. She knew much more than anyone else because she lived with him as a spouse. Subhanallah. Certain things that only she knew how he lived and how he was intimate with his own family members and so on. Only she knew she related to us. And this is why those who want to destroy the ummah find fault in Aisha radiallahu anha. Once you dislike her, you discount her narrations, you've discounted half of the deen. Another man they would discount is Abu Huraira radiallahu anha. Once you find discount him, you've almost entered the destruction of the entire deen. So this is why be careful of those who utter such dirty words against the creme de la creme. Subhanallah, subhanallah. You know, those who have achieved ranks, always you get people who are jealous of them. And those who achieve the most and the highest of ranks, they suffer the most at the hands of the rumors of the people. So much so that there happened to be an incident in the life of Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was known as a pure woman, a Siddiqa to bint Siddiq. She was the daughter of the most loved man to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And she was the truthful, the daughter of the truthful, the one who believed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet they accused her after the battle of Bani al-Mustaliq of having committed adultery with a man who was also a great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal radiallahu an. So who created the story? Again, the jealous lot. Up to this day, jealous lots create great stories and fabrications, rumors against those who have achieved a lot, especially in terms of the deen. In order to discount the deen and in order to turn people away from the religion, be careful of this. My brothers and sisters, she is the only woman whom her chastity has been declared in the Quran. Surah An-Nur, if you read it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clarified the name of Aisha radiallahu anha in so many verses and declared that anyone who believes that Aisha radiallahu anha was not chaste and a pure woman actually has disagreed or disbelieved in a verse of the Quran. And if you disbelieve in a verse of the Quran, how can you call yourself a Muslim? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us guidance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure us of the diseases of the heart. Some of us become jealous of one another to the degree that we start spreading rumor about one another and cause great destruction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So she was a woman who was the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was her age at the time she married Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The truth is there is difference of opinion. There is consensus that she passed away in the year 57 or 58 Hijri, not earlier than that. And her age at the time of her death, radiallahu anha, consensus that it was 67 years of age, subhanallah. If that was the case, start doing the mathematics and go back. She was asked later on when she was old about her marriage. So she said, oh, I was fixed up to him in the sense that, you know, at that time, subhanallah, the age of majority was about nine. That was the age of majority. You know, in recent history, just today, I was doing a research on the age of majority in a lot of the countries, including in the West. And now, before it was 14, then it moved up to 16, then it moved up to 18. And now in some countries, they want to push it up to 21. Subhanallah, the age of majority. Doesn't that show that we are maturing much later than the people before us? And it shows also that the women supposedly mature earlier than men. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, I hope the men don't get upset with this. But it definitely does show that. And I think it proves that and we know this. So at the same time, what we need to know is the age of majority that was declared a hundred years ago and that which is today, 
does not make those of a hundred years ago any sort of you know barbaric people or people who really abused their children. A'udhu Billah. No, they were matured at an earlier age. To this day, and I was reading the rules and regulations of the United States of America. A few hours ago, I was going through it, and subhanallah, something interesting that you find is the age of marriage. If there is consent of the parents, some of the states drop it down to 14, and some of them have no age limit. Do you know that? They say for as long as the parents agree, some of them make mention of pregnancy. If there's a pregnancy here, Aisha radiallahu anha, the idea was not all about sex as we would think today. We have such dirty minds that are so immature that even at the age of 30, we are stuck in computer games and movies. We haven't yet come out of the games and movies and we are 40 years old. I have so many issues that come to me from people who've reached their 30s and 40s complaining about their spouses. My husband cannot leave this FIFA game and whole day he's with it. Subhanallah. He's playing with the cars and he's playing with his Nintendo Wii until he almost wees. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. Wallahi. It's something sad. So this is the maturity of today's men and women. And I'm speaking really, I'm generalizing it. There are exceptions to the rule and the exceptions might be majority who knows but I'd like to differ with that a lot of us may not be as mature as those although we think we were but the point is don't pick on people of the past just because your culture is different it was the norm at the time if they cried foul yes we would be able to say hey that was not normal at the time but they did not cry foul one day if the age of majority has to push up to 30 years old does that mean we who married at the age of 18 for example were Pedophiles, na'udhu billah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. This is the dirty mind that thinks in a dirty way. And this is why for us, marriage is all about sex sometimes. Why? Because that's the only thing we looked forward to. Astaghfirullah. If you're a true believer, that's not the case. And it was never the case in with Aisha radiallahu anha. She, she was brought up as the most knowledgeable. One of the main reasons why Allah asked or instructed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to marry her. He married her not with his own choice, with the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was because as a young person, she would be able to memorize, live in the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa much longer. We all know that she was the second last from amongst the wives of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ummahatul Mu'mineen to pass away. We spoke about that yesterday as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. So we should be passionate about defending the honor of this great woman that Allah has defended the honor of from above the seven heavens. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. She was a woman who used to say that even though we were part of the most blessed of the family of the most blessed and the highest of all creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were months that went by when we did not light our stove because we had nothing to eat besides water and dates. And this goes to show the condition upon which they were pleased. Subhanallah. Today, if you don't have food in your home, I don't think your family would last a week. Allahu Akbar. They'd probably go home or they'd probably do something else. May Allah grant us the ability to be happy with the little that we have. Here is the best of creation and the best of all females. You know, one day she asked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who from amongst your wives will be in paradise? Obviously, that's a very intelligent question. So he says, don't worry, you are from amongst them. Allahu Akbar. So she was even told that she's from paradise. Subhanallah. And she says, there were months that went by. We saw the moon, we saw another moon and another moon and we had not yet lit the stove. We didn't have much. How many of us can bear patience with our spouses when they do not have much? How many of us can adjust our lives? Yet the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, who is the most beloved to you without even Hesitating, he says, Aisha radiallahu anha, subhanallah, subhanallah, such a great woman radiallahu anha. So it is reported that then there came a time after the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when she was sent 1,000 or 100,000 silver coins. And in no time she distributed it amongst the poor. She was fasting that day. So her servant asks her, oh, mother of the believers, why didn't you keep a little bit so I could buy some meat, some meat for you to break your fast? She says, had you reminded me earlier, which means it didn't even cross my mind because there are people who are more in need. This was Aisha radiallahu anha, the generous, the one who was concerned about the ummah, the one who taught us so much. She says, those who hate me, 
Why do they even visit the grave of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Because that is my house. Subhanallah. Have you thought of that? He passed away on her lap. He passed away on her day. And he passed away in her house. And he was buried in her house. So all of us, when we say we visit Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's grave, Al Mubarak, the, the grave, where are we going? What are we doing? Subhanallah, we are going to the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, like it or not. Subhanallah, may Allah grant us the good fortune of visiting the Rawdah and visiting the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen. So, my brothers and sisters, here is the great woman, Aisha radiallahu anha. You hear the name, and immediately you think of how Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved her so much. He was so free with her in speech. He was so romantic in his speech. She had pink cheeks and she was pink in color and she blushed very quickly. And he used to tease her by calling her Humaira. Humaira meaning today, perhaps in our terms, we might say pinky, you know, subhanallah, which means, you know, you're becoming so pink and you're blushing. And he used to make her laugh and he used to make her blush when he used to drink. And this was narrated to us, subhanallah, by Aisha radiallahu anha. When he used to drink from the utensil, he made sure that she drank and then he looked for the position where her lips were and he drank from the same place whilst watching her blush. Subhanallah. She ate from a piece of meat. He would make sure that he let her eat. Then he would take it from her and look for the place where she bit and whilst looking at her would bite from the same place, making her blush. Radiyallahu anha. How can we say a word against her? How can we actually believe anything that those who are trying to tell us that she was a disgrace to the Ummah, na'udhu billah, how can we even allow that to infiltrate or even to create a doubt in our minds and hearts? Aisha radiallahu anha, the greatest of the women, the one from paradise, the one whom Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa loved the most, the one whom Sauda bint Zam'a radiallahu anha, who was an elderly woman, Ummul Mu'mineen, also a wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa When she was old, she says, you know, my night, I'd like to give it to Aisha radiallahu anha. Because she knew the virtue of Aisha. She knew how close she was to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha radiallahu anha. She is the woman who says that when I was much younger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took me once to a place where we raced with each other. We ran. So I beat him, subhanallah. I, you know, I left him behind. I ran faster than him. And then after some time when I grew a bit bigger and older, and you know, she says I had a bit more fat. That's the word she uses. And she says, he took me again, subhanallah. And then subhanallah, he ran faster than I did, subhanallah. So it was 1-1, one, one. Allahu Akbar, not a football match of today. My brothers and sisters, we are too keen on watching things rather than doing with our wives and family members what would bring back and revive the relationship between us. A lot of us would sit in front of the TV and or the internet and perhaps flick our remotes or the keyboard or tap the phone for long hours, not realizing real life is when you take them out, spend some time with them, go with them, forget about your phone. And I challenge you to go on a holiday for three days, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leaving your phones and computers behind. Ready? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Sometimes maybe the women might tell you we're not ready. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, look at the love. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once eating and he spoke about the virtue of Aisha. You know, Tharid is one of the best dishes of the Arabs, very expensive and very delicious. So he says, Fadlu Aisha fadli Tharidi ala sa'ir ta'am. He says the virtue of Aisha from amongst all the other women is like the virtue of this food known as Tharid, which was the best, the most tasty and at the same time quite luxurious, something that was considered a, a delicacy, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to respect and honor the woman. Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother of the believers. So she is the one who did not have children. And I'm going to pause here for a moment. Today from amongst us, there are those whom Allah has not blessed with children. Listen to this carefully. Allah has blessed you with so many other things. Concentrate on those things. Subhanallah. Your paradise is your patience. The best of the women did not have children. Look at Aisha radiallahu anha. The best of them all, she did not have children. So much so, they used to call her Umm Abdullah, the mother of Abdullah sometimes. Why? That was her nephew, the son of her sister Asma binti Abi Bakr, Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam. This is the man whom we said moments ago that he says, I did not see anyone more knowledgeable than her. So she says, 
I used to look after her so much that some of the people, I used to look after him so much that some of the people used to call me Umm Abdullah, the mother of Abdullah, just to make me happy, subhanallah. But I did not have children. And she was always happy with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Umm al Mu'minina radiyallahu anha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease and goodness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her and bless us all. She passed away in the year 57 or 58 Hijri, the 17th of Ramadan. And they read her janazah after the salah of the evening. And it was led according to the narrations by Abu Huraira radiallahu anha. Her age was 67 years. And at the same time, those who buried her were her nephews. Subhanallah. Abdullah ibn Zubair, Urwa ibn Zubair radiallahu anhuma as well as Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, also her nephew, with Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, and also Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr. So these were her nephews and grandnephews. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant her goodness and a lofty rank in paradise. She has served the ummah, and she has been a mother of the believers, and we will never pick on anything to do with her in a negative way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her and bless us all. The next heroine that we are going to be speaking about today, a great woman also who was told by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when I visited paradise, you know, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went up in Mi'raj. I heard someone walk and when I asked, who is that? They told me, this is a Rumaysa binti Malhan, the mother of Anas ibn Malik, subhanallah. So this would mean, that she's from amongst those who was also given glad tidings of paradise. Her name was a Rumaysa bint Malhan or Milhan. And some say it was Rumaysa with a Ghain in the Arabic language. But the most correct opinion is it is a Rumaysa with a Ra. And at the same time, she was known as Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha. She was the mother of Anas ibn Malik. She was married to a man known as Malik ibn Nadr. And she is from Medina Munawwara. She was very happy in her marriage, so much so that they used to always say, look at this couple, they're so happy, so delighted. But one day, that changed. Why did it change? Because Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu came to Medina Munawwara and started teaching that the worship of idols is wrong, we need to worship Allah alone. So, Ar-Rumaysa binti Malhan radiallahu anha, she accepted the message. She said, you know what? We are worshipping the roots of a tree, the bark of a tree that is carved into a little idol. How can we do this? I believe in my maker, Allah alone. So she accepted Islam and her husband became very, very angry, but she was extremely intelligent. So she said, okay, let's discuss the matter. Whoever wins the debate, we follow. And she won the debate hands down, subhanallah. She won the debate completely. She started speaking to him. Okay, you worship this, who carved it? Okay, it was that man in Medina Munawwara. Okay, where is it from? It's the root of a tree. So you worship the root of a tree. Is that what it is? And she was quiet. She said, I worship whoever made me. Now what are you saying? So he was so upset. They had a child known as Anas. She used to tell the little child as a baby. Oh Anas, say la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Subhanallah. Say there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And the husband used to get very angry. Stop messing my child. You're messing his mind, his brain. Subhanallah. So she said, look, there's nothing I can do because you are wrong. I already told you, if you can prove to me that you are right, it's fine. But that will never happen. I've just proven to you that I was right. So he decided, okay, I'm leaving. I'm going. So he was going to Asham, Asham, and he decided, I don't want to stay with these people. And I don't want to live in Medina because a lot of people have started accepting Islam. It was not in his good fortune to be a Muslim. So Malik ibn Nadr. He passed away in Asham and some narrations say he was actually killed by highwaymen on his way when he went all alone. And the news came to ar rumaysa binti Malhan that your husband has just been killed or he has died. And she was very sad because she had hoped that he would see the light. But at the same time, she promised, I'm not going to marry now again. I've got a child known as Anas. I need to look after him and I need to inculcate within him the love of the deen and Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So much so that as he grew up, remember when the hijrah took place, what happened? Subhanallah. She rushed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam with the little child. And he was a boy, very young boy, approximately 10. And 
she goes to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and says that everyone has come to you with various gifts. I am giving you the son of mine to serve you. And Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked in his eyes and saw that he was a, a good child and took him in. Anas ibn Malik is the one who says, I served Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for 10 years. Every time I looked at his face, I said, this is the most beautiful of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. So Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, that was the man. The mother, she started getting proposals after the husband had died, but she did not accept any of them. And a proposal came from a man known as Zayd ibn Sahal, also known as Abu Talha, later to be known as radiallahu anha. An. So, he says, I am proposing to marry you. O oh, Ummu Sulaim, I am proposing to marry you. And don't turn me back. So she says, but you worship a tree and the bark of a tree and the roots of a tree. How can I marry you? If you accept Islam, I have no problem. But if our faith is different, the same thing will happen that happened with Malik ibn Nadr. I cannot accept this. So he said, okay, let me think about it. He went back, thought about it. Following day, he comes back. And he walks to, towards Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa according to some narrations and according to others, he declares his shahada. He says, I've thought about it and indeed you are right. Because she was powerful in her ability and capacity to convince people. She was very intelligent, radiallahu anha, convinced the man. He accepted the deen. And in one narration, he was coming towards Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And immediately Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa looked at him and told his companions, I see Islam between the eyes of this man. He's coming here to accept the deen. And truly he came and he declared his shahada without any words. And then he was married to uh, Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha. They were blessed in many ways. This woman, Ar-Rumaysa binti Malhan, was such a great woman. She was always concerned about the happiness of her husband. So much so that they were blessed with a child. <clears throat> they were blessed with a child. And the child happened, in fact, when the child was born, okay, this, the, the first child that we're going to speak about is a child who fell ill when Abu Talha wanted to go on one of his journeys. So the child fell ill and Abu Talha was not too keen on going. But the wife says, you know what? You may go, he's okay, he's fine. He will be fine, inshallah. So she did not want him to break his journey or not to go for something very important. When he went, the child had passed away. When he came back, she had already told the family members, please do not tell Abu Talha that the child has passed away. I will tell him. So he came in the evening. She had prepared food. She had, you know, made sure that he was calm, smiled. How is the child? So she said, he is very comfortable. He's very comfortable. He's in a very good state. Subhanallah. And he came, he had a good meal. He slept the night. Subhanallah. Made sure that, you know, that he did not feel the burden as he had come from the journey when he was well rested. She asks him a question. Oh Abu Talha, if someone were to give you something, if someone were to lend you something for a while, and the day they came to get it back from you, do you have a right to refuse? He said, no. So Allah had given you a child and he has taken the child back. Subhanallah. He was obviously taken, but at the same time, because of how it was explained to him, it softened the blow. He accepted it as the decree of Allah. And he understood that there is no way that we will be able to get closure except by what is known as a rida bil qada, to be happy with the decree of Allah. There is no way. Today, we want to find closure by punishing this one and doing that to this one and doing this to the other one and blaming that one and blaming this one. The blame game never brings about closure. In fact, it brings about more blood on the wounds that were about to cure. Subhanallah. Because every time you're about to cure, a new wound opens. The best way of closure in Islam is a rida bil qada, to be happy with the decree of Allah, to understand that Allah is the creator. He loves the ones he took away more than we could ever love them because he made them in the first place. Allahu Akbar. So when he understood this, he was okay. But in the morning he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, you know what? My wife did not tell me immediately. She delayed and she did this and did that. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam praised her. 
And Muhammad ﷺ made the dua for them and said, May Allah grant you barakah. May Allah grant you blessings in your offspring, in your family and so on. It is reported that they had another child known as Abdullah ibn Abi Talha. And he became one of the top companions and at the same time a very knowledgeable person from his offspring. They were 10 from amongst those who were knowledgeable, known as the noteworthy, the knowledgeable in their time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us too barakah in our offspring and blessings. This is a Rumaysa binti Malhan radiallahu anha. It is reported also that in the battle of Hunain, the battle of Uhud, she witnessed the two battles and perhaps even more that we may not know of. In Uhud with Aisha radiallahu anha, she was giving water to those who were injured, subhanallah. In the battle of Hunayn, she was from amongst those who was serving the sick, or should I say those who were injured. And she was also serving with bringing water and encouraging the men and so on, so many different ways. In fact, the Sahabiyat, if you think of the names of those who helped and assisted the believers at times of war, one of the great names that comes to mind is a great woman from amongst the Sahabiyat known as Rafida, Rafida al Ansariya, radiyallahu anha. So much so that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent to him some of the sent to her some of the companions saying, "Let them go to the tent of Rafida. She will take care of them." Subhanallah, Subhanallah, amazing. So she used to. She was the first who had a proper tent in order to nurse those who were hurt and injured. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless these great women, subhanallah. Another great incident at the time of Abu Talha radiallahu an, and this great heroine of ours, subhanallah, al rumaysa binti Malhan radiallahu anha, when she was about to deliver, they were coming back from a journey with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she started getting some pains, labor pains. And Abu Talha had a choice between remaining with her and continuing back to Medina with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So she decides to say, Oh Abu Talha, the pains I have this time are nowhere near the pains I had the last time. They are far lighter. I will manage. I will make it to Medina Munawwara. And so they continued the journey. She came to Medina Munawwara and a little while later she delivered. Very easy delivery by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, who was the servant of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the brother of the little child who was born. What happened? He brings the child to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, newborn. So immediately he understood. He says, that must be the child of Ummu Sulaim. He did the technique of the child. He blessed the child and he named the child Abdullah. This is the Abdullah that we spoke about a few minutes ago. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all, grant us barakah in our offspring, in our families. Look at the lessons we learn. These are the women. These are the men. These are our heroes and heroines. Subhanallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all. She passed away. Ummu Sulaim al rumaysa binti Malhan radiallahu anha in Medina Munawwara and she is buried in Baqi' Subhanallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. This eve, my brothers and sisters, do not forget to pray for the ummah, the entire ummah. We are living in a time where the heart bleeds to see what is going on across the globe from the east to the west, the north to the south. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on humanity at large. And may he grant us our sanity at the same time. And may he grant us iman and strengthen that iman and the bond that is there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us and may he grant us love between each other. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Allahumma inna ka'afuhun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anna. اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد سبحان الله بحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوه إليك